You are watching Pearl Osa Talks Kingfluence on Life of Interruptions. Let's take a few steps back to the MacG episode on religion. He says, okay, does this mean angels have penises? These fallen angels were created to be in heaven. There's no need for a penis in heaven. Balance me there, he says. The Bible story of Noah and his three sons of different race and the one who was cursed being the African one. To me, that is self-hate. That story doesn't make sense. It's just fictional and suitable for infants. You are lost and psychologically enslaved by their doctrine. Wake up, African. Some of the questions I did not and will not entertain because I realized that they were, they were an attempt to make a mockery of our faith. You know, they, they came from a, from a jabbing kind of perspective. I am Pearl Osser, but you can call me the possibility broker. Because in a life of interruptions, we all need someone to remind us that nothing is impossible. I invite you to conversations where we will learn and grow together. Conversations about Kingfluence. Kingfluence means many things. It's a confluence of kingdom influences. Everything we do is influenced by the royalty that we are. We are kingdom. We are power. We are victorious. In faith, in love, in business, in leisure, in life generally, we do kingdom, period. Hey, 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 family. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Now, for those of you who've just joined us, back might seem a bit uh, weird because you literally just got to know of my existence. So let's take a few steps back to the MACG episode on religion that I was so graciously invited to. I want to give a shout out to MACG and the team. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the gracious way in which you handle the interview. So when I got the call, I was reluctant. I'll tell you the honest truth. Here's my philosophy. I don't believe that anyone ever um, accepted salvation, received Jesus Christ into their heart as Lord and Savior because the other person won an argument. And so for me, that is not the way to represent um, God and his kingdom by fighting and trying to prove how clever people are. And so I expected that kind of controversy. I expected that kind of, uh, you know, pitting one religion up against the other. And um, therefore, I'll be honest with you, I was reluctant to go. But I went through and that's not what it was at all. Um, he made it clear that the intentions of um, both cast and crew of the podcast and chill was to create a platform where people just presented their religions and their various beliefs and their value system. And um, so that's what we went for. We spoke. Yes, there were some um, differences, but I think they were handled very respectfully. That's, that's my view. And I want to let you know that prayer went into that outcome. So after the show, I uh, spoke to McG and I told him that you really, really threw me off. I wasn't expecting it to be so chilled. I thought we were coming here to bicker at each other and I came determined not to do that because that's not the kingdom from which I come. And he made it clear that that was not their intentions either. They just wanted a conversation. So um, that went down quite well. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, representing the Lord. Did I go prepared? I'll be honest. No, because as I said, I thought they were coming from a different angle. But you know, the Bible says that when you're called um, to to make representations, do not necessarily prepare what you will say, but lean into the Holy Spirit and he will give you utterance. And I think that that is what happened. So fast forward to where we are right now. Um, a lot of you watched that. You asked for um, a rerun. Um, some people asked for me to come back and be put up against, and that's the exact word that we're running away from, put up against some other um, faith leaders, let me call them that. Um, and the reason I'm reluctant to, to indulge is because I see that what, what the people who've made that particular request are looking for is entertainment. You want to see the bickering, the fighting, the Jerry Springer kind of feel. Um, and I'm going to repeat myself. My mission is to empower Christians, to show them the beauty of the word, to show them the power in the word, to show them their priesthood and how they can overcome, live an overcoming life and fulfill purpose and destiny in power. And that's never going to be accomplished by me trying to show my smarts against someone else. Here's my argument. If you come from America and you operate by a different constitution, and I come from Japan and I operate by a different constitution, we look like absolute idiots 
sitting at each other saying, my constitution says this, well, my constitution says that. Clearly, we're of two different kingdoms. There's no discussion to be had. I think the discussion becomes necessary when we both say we're American or we're both Japanese um, and our interpretation of that constitution is different. But once you put it straight up from the beginning that, listen, you're from there and I'm from here, then there's really nothing to talk to. My assignment on the podcast was to speak to those um, who want to know about uh, my kingdom, the kingdom I come from and the constitution that we, we, we go by, which is the Bible. And hence I kept saying the Bible says the Bible says. Um, it didn't go down well with everyone. Some people were like, why are you telling us what the Bible says? We're not of that constitution. We don't care. And I get that. So um, the reason I have come back to my YouTube channel, which has been in existence for a couple of years, is that uh, a few of you found me on the socials. You came to Instagram, you came to TikTok, and you categorically said, we see that you're not active enough on YouTube and we want you back on YouTube. So here I am. In the interim, I've had a TV show on um, TBN, airing on DSTV, I think it's 343. Um, I've done two seasons and we are maybe going to prepare for season three, but it was called Kingfluence Talks Word and that came from the kingdom influence. It was a confluence of kingdom influencers, um, people who exert positive impact and positive influence. So it was. this is pretty much going to be a, a continuation of both the YouTube channel that I had before and Kingfluence Talk Show. Um, you know, where the intention was to do a Bible study. Let me do a very quick story time. So I uh, got called by the Lord in 2019 into a beauty pageant. And um, I believed that because he called me, then he had already set the road before me to win. So I went in for the crown, quite cocky, I must tell you. And I got in and I didn't win. And then I asked him, so what was that about? And he said to me, two things. Number one, I didn't let you win on that platform because I didn't want anyone other than myself to own you. But I brought you to the platform in the first place, not to give you a win as the world counts a win, not to give you a crown like the world counts a crown. But I brought you there because I wanted you to be able to be within the industry and influence from inside the industry. Because we sit at home and we look on TV and we're just like, oh my goodness, and he's supposed to be a believer and see the way she's talking and see the way she's carrying herself. And um, he was like, how would they know if no one teaches? How they know if no one preaches. The truth of the matter is so many of the people that we are called to reach are not going to go into a church on any given Sunday. Um, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and whatever else is coming have become the new sources of influence and uh, of entertainment and of education. And so I needed to package myself as what I call an edutainer and come into the space and share the gospel. So that's how we found ourselves on MACG, and the response has been so overwhelming that I realized it would be a disservice to the kingdom, to we company of believers who think the same way, um, not to respond to that call and, um, and come out and bring the content. So um, thank you so much for the feedback. Thank you so much for the comments. Thank you so much for the follows. Um, I believe that a community is being formed from what happened on that beautiful day, and we're going to gather around here, answering questions, um, speaking the word. And I'm not saying I'm coming to teach the word. I know that in kingdom there are five, um, would you call them officers? What would you call them? Uh, let's say officers for now. That's not the word, but English has just eluded me right now. So you've got the apostle, you've got the pastor, the evangelist, um, the, who's the fourth one? The prophet, yes. And then you've got the teacher. I've always considered myself a teacher. And I do think that it's, Probably, you know, one of the most humble of the, it is the humblest of the five officers, but also holds a very great deal um, of responsibility in the sense that if you teach people in the wrong direction and they make the wrong moves on the basis of the nonsense that you've taught, you will answer to the Father on the given day. So um, while it is a call and a gifting that I have been given, I don't come here with the mindset that I know it all. I think we can definitely exchange ideas. I mean, there's people who've reached out to me and said, um, can I, can I DM you on the side because there are some insights I'd like to share? And I've said, listen, please share them publicly because we all need to learn. We see in part, we prophesy in part. And, um, if I can get a bit of what you have and vice versa, I think we can grow. The one thing that will not be coming from me is, is, is bashing and controversy and war of words. I'm not into that. Um, 
I have gone through, I stayed away from YouTube on purpose. I, but the people who came into my world um, or invited me directly into a conversation, I have looked at some of the comments. Um, some of them I want to address today. Um, and the reason I did not address them there and then, like go into the comments and start, was because literally you'd be opening a can of worms. Um, how much can you say in a paragraph or in a TikTok video to really get to the heart of some of the things that you, you know, you know that are behind the question? Some of the questions I did not and will not entertain because I realized that they were, they were an attempt to make a mockery of our faith. You know, they, they came from a, from a jabbing kind of perspective. And, you know, it's cool to be able to jab back and, you know, you give me one and I give you two and I show you that I have just as much, you know, uh, fire as you do. That's cool, but I'm not trying to be cool. I'm not trying to be relevant. I'm trying to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So on the last day, um, I need to account for all of my words. And, and how much of my time did I spend fulfilling the Great Commission versus telling you, calling you out your name? You know, I'm not about that. So um, there's been quite a lot of impact. There's been a lot of positive commentary. Again, I say thank you for that. And I, I, I hope that we can form a community here. We're going for... Uh, for the numbers and purely because, um, you know, I think there's too many people with the truth without the followership. And so the truth gets hidden. And so if you can just help us to build this channel. So while we're on that note, could you please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share this video um, with as many people. I'm sure when you told them, I saw this big haired woman on the MacG podcast, uh, they were like, oh, I'd like to see more stuff from her. So if you can share this, I'd be extremely grateful. Um, and let's build this thing up. Let's see how far and how fast we can take the gospel forward and build his kingdom, advance his agenda. Um, I want to touch on some of the comments that came through various uh, platforms. I think they would make for, um, I think they'd make for interesting uh, knowledge building. I think that's my, that's my assignment, to build knowledge. Um, in the future, um, videos, we're going to do more of really, really unpacking because that's what a lot of you guys asked for. Like, we need to hear more, we need more knowledge. And the big thing for me is, is the power in your priesthood. What does priesthood mean and how do you engage that priesthood? So there's going to be tons of videos on that. Um, and I will juxtapose the light against the dark so that people have a clear understanding of the choices they've made and they're wise and they own that, you know, like with chest out, you go out and like, I have chosen that this is what I'm going to worship. This is who I'm going to venerate. Um, and you and your Jesus can take a back seat or you know what, actually, this is my choice, whichever way, but you, you will know the wise behind your decision. I think that's, that's the core of where we want to go without slighting anyone. Um, before I even get into some of the questions that I have here, here's something I want to say. I heard a lot of pain in the comments, a lot of pain from our um, African people who have been for centuries marginalized, ostracized, oppressed, robbed, and raped. And, you know, to a great extent, the narrative is that the source of all of this pain is, is the gospel, or at least the one who came with the gospel. And so since I cannot accept the one who came with the gospel, it's difficult for me to accept the gospel itself. I don't want to come at anyone with any kind of name because it would be, I think, unfair and insensitive to not recognize that that pain is legitimate that our people truly have gone through something. And so when they hear a narrative that says Ham was cursed, um, I've had people come out and tell me I'm lost, psychologically enslaved by their doctrine, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not even coming at you angry. I completely get where you're coming from. Um, but I'm hoping that we will over time share the kind of knowledge that gets you to see that you are empowered, that gets you to see how great you are, how great we are, and, and why there's been a narrative pushed, there's been an experience pushed over us collectively as an African people for us to just never ever come to the realization of how precious we are in the eyes of God. Um, that's, that's my intention. So this person on Twitter says to me, the Bible story of Noah and his three sons of different race and the one who was cursed being the African one. To me, that is self-hate. 
That story doesn't make sense. It's just fictional and suitable for infants. You are lost and psychologically enslaved by their doctrine. Wake up, African. Okay, so um, thank you for engaging. I mean, for even coming through in the comments. You could have, you know, blessed and passed on. I'm not sure uh, if that wouldn't have been a better better response, but then again, other people would not have benefited from this. So let me just go back to what we said about Ham on the show. You had Noah, he had three sons. He had Ham, he had Shem, he had Japheth. These three sons were, as we know as parents, I have 11 biological children. We know that our children are, are our wards. We are stewards of these children that are our wards. They are not our property. They belong first and foremost to God. And when God brings his children, his word says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. I know the plans that I have towards you. And so when he makes any of his children, he makes them with a redemptive purpose, a redemptive call. He has a plan and a purpose. He has, he has a blessing for the children. However, in this instance, um, we had a situation where Noah was ticked off, and rightly so, by his son Ham. And he cursed his son Ham. He cursed him to two generations. You shall be a servant of servants, right? Um, speaking of Canaan, shall be a servant of servants. Now, does that mean that the blessings of the Lord would make rich and add no sorrow are not upon the people of Ham? I don't think so. I don't think that Noah's curse on Ham completely obliterated God's blessings upon his children. However, the Bible is clear about a curse. It says a curse without a cause will not stand. And so in this instance, would you say that there was a cause? Yes, there was. But here is the other thing. He is the one who, who has times and seasons in his hands. And we might go through a season or a time or a dispensation where things go on, but they never last. They never last. Um, you know, he would come at some point and he will redeem his people. So we've gone through three, uh, we're on the third day now as an African people. I'm sitting here now in 2023, which is the third year in the third decade of the third millennium. And um, three, as you would know, is the number of resurrection. So I believe that Shem had their time. They uh, brought forth the Messiah. We praise God for them. That was their time. I believe that Japheth had his time. He brought forth the oracles, the Bible that we have today. Wonderful. That was his time. Now was the time for the sons of Ham to arise. We would be in denial if we say we do not look around the African continent and see evidence of a curse in operation, right? Because we were a people, once revered, a people who um, held such great knowledge. We built universities. We built the pyramids. We, um, we have libraries of books of mathematical equations that we came up with before any of the other races or any of the other continents even knew how to get up and wash their faces in the morning. This is the people of whom we come from, right? If you take Nimrod, so Nimrod starts this thing of let us build a tower, let it go up, um, and he was the, 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 the source of this whole Babylonian mess. And Nimrod was a black man. He was an African, but that is evidence of such great intelligence being corrupted. Okay. The point I'm trying to make is that we're now in a season where blessings are coming. We're now in a season where the curse is to be overturned. Curses have existed in scripture from time immemorial. You see, uh, we open in Genesis 3 with a curse. Um, Adam is cursed. At that point, we're not arguing whether Adam is white or black or African or European. That's irrelevant. He is the one man through whom the Bible tells us all of creation fell. All of creation came under a curse. But even from that point, we see God beginning to make a redemptive plan because he's like, listen, I didn't make my creation to go to waste. I'm going to come back for you. I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to redeem you. And he brought the Savior. You see uh, the account of Reuben who slept with his father's concubine, and um, which is, I mean, that's just a taboo in any generation. And his father says to him, listen, he curses him, you, you uncovered my bed, um, and you shall be unstable in all your ways. This is the curse of the firstborn. Some of us will even look and say, we've noticed a, a trend where, um, whether in the Bible or in families that we might know, where the firstborn doesn't seem as stable 
um, as successful, maybe, as the ones that come next. Uh, we even see that Jesus comes as the second Adam to rectify that which the first Adam did. But where I'm driving at is that the curse that was on Reuben, this curse was turned around by another father. That father was Moses. So Moses comes and he breaks the curse that had been spoken over Reuben and blesses him in its stead. So in this day and age as Africans, instead of going on about how we are lost to even believe that um, as African people we're operating under a curse, I would say that our call should be to raise a breed of fathers who are able to turn around that curse, who are able to appropriate the finished works of Christ Jesus, who are able to lead us in that direction, um, lead us back to the Lord where the blessings are vested, lead us back to the place where God is waiting to bless his people. It is the turn of the African people. So what were the innate blessings that were given? So um, it was said that Shem would, would bring forth the Messiah, Japheth would dwell in the tents of Shem and he would scribe. But the, the, the blessing that was not spoken, which is the innate blessing of the African people, is that of the priesthood. And where there is priesthood, there is power. The Bible says that when the priesthood changes, of necessity there is a change of law. So we hold the change even of policy that will shift our nations and really, truth be told, shift the global economy, uh, the global landscape of politics uh, and everything else, um, technology, ETC, as you see it today. He's turned his eye to Africa. So when I share that Ham was cursed, it, it, it was a fact. I mean, any of us who are born again now know that we did come under a curse when Adam ate of the fruit of the tree, which he shouldn't have done. Are we going to negate that? No, but we're going to now say, listen, that is a, a past tense where I'm concerned. As an African person, as an individual, forget even what, what, what race or what nationality or what continent, as an Afri as a person, the first thing is, when I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, all things are passed away, all things have become new. I am no longer under a curse, and no one can curse he who the Lord has chosen to bless. I am set free, and I am free indeed. If we can appropriate that reality for ourselves as, as individuals, you best believe that we can appropriate that reality for our people in general, for our nations, for our communities, for our villages, for our families, and for the continent. And this is the time. So rather than forming anonymity behind Twitter um, and texting each other uh, and being keyboard warriors, I think we should be finding ways to unite in this season um, to appropriate the blessings of the Lord that make rich and add no sorrow. We should be standing and insisting on the fact that this is indeed the third day, that in the third day we are rising, that in the third day we are redeeming our people with the blood of the Lamb and undoing the... We need fathers to rise up like Moses did and release blessings upon our people. Problem is, a lot of those fathers, not all, not all but there are fathers, let me put it this way, there are dissenting voices, there are people who are pointing us back in the direction of the very idolatry that has had us increasingly alienated from God as a people. The scripture is clear on idols. You shall have no other God beside me. You shall make no graven images. You shall worship no other idols. And yet we continue to do this and grieve the spirit of the Most High God under whatever texts and guises. And I think that a lot of it is based on, on ignorance. And I think a lot of it is based on a people who, you know, the Bible describes it like this, who are spoiled and no one says restore. So I want to believe that we are a group of people coming together on this and various other platforms, and our cry is restore. Our cry is saying, no one can convince me that being a Christian is a point or a place or a posture of weakness. Instead, it is the height of power. And I'm in the season and I am of that generation where I will exercise that power to see to it that the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And, and it's got nothing to do with color. If we really, really unpack scripture, you will see he was not concerned with color to start with. If you really unpack scripture, you will see a lot of honor and a lot of reference made to African people. I'm reminded of the Kushite who came second in the race to get to the king to explain what had happened. Um, and that's what's happening in the season. When that Kushite arrives, you know, he gets there and the other runner had gone with no story. And the king says, stand to the side. 
He didn't get a seat. He wasn't seated. He stood waiting. There comes that Kushite. We might be that Kushite, that Egyptian, that black man, that, that black race in the season that seems to have been running and has not quite arrived. But this is the day and we have arrived. Um, and so there is no sense of inferiority. Uh, there's no sense of a curse. If I can sit here and tell you as a born again child of Christ, that uh, of God, that I am not under a curse, then it is my responsibility to take the next step and be what, what, what we're told uh, uh, is a minister of reconciliation. I found reconciliation in Christ. I need to begin to redeem and reconcile my communities, my nations, my cities back to God. So we are not a cursed people anymore. The time of the curse is over. It is up to us to appropriate the blessings. It is us to, up to our fathers to arise and bless us and turn around the curse that was spoken. We are, as a people, a, a lot of the argument has been around, you know, I'm going to venerate my ancestors. I'm going to call on my ancestors. I'm going to ask my ancestors. Um, we can get into that on another day. I, 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 I mentioned, I was very clear in the podcast that I think that we must honor our ancestors, but we cannot worship our ancestors. Um, we honor them. Till today, when the Jews speak, they say God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. They, they remember the lineage. And we explained that the reason that we recognize our lineage is for two reasons. Number one, because I need to know the prophetic calling that runs through my ancestry so that I take up my part in that and I run with it. There is a prophetic baton that is passed on from generation to generation. I take my part and I run with it. Secondly, when I come across things that bother me, you know, uh, say, for example, this person gets divorced and she looks through the bloodline. Her mom got divorced before her and looks through the bloodline. Her grandmother got divorced before her. We don't look to our ancestors and praise them. We look to our ancestors to see that, okay, there seems to be a generational thing flowing through the bloodline and I am the one with whom it is going to stop. But if I don't recognize it exists, then how then do I ensure that with me it stops? The book of Job says, inquire of the generations past because we are but shadows. So the form the, the substance is in the generation that came before us. We're a shadow. We're playing out. Unless we come to that place where we say, you know what? It stops with me, and I'm starting a whole new generation from my uh, lineage. So, okay, so I'm hoping that that answers. We are not infants. We're not psychologically enslaved. It is not their doctrine. It is the word of God. We are fully, fully awake. We are blessed and highly favored. All righty. Let's see what the next comment said. It says... Um, Okay, she got her scripture, but the Genesis 6 explanation is faulty. The sons of man are the kids that didn't follow Cain's ways who remained with Adam. Okay, I must just clarify, I did not mention the sons of man, I mentioned the sons of God. Uh, maybe we should look at it. I'm just going to go to Genesis chapter 6. So I'm hoping that I, I interpreted, you know, it's, it's, to go off social media is so dicey because you can't get the person's context. You can't get uh, their expression. You can't get their full feeling. So I'm having to feel around for what I think is the context of, your, of the emotion you're expressing there. <clears throat> Genesis 6, chapter 1, uh, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Okay. In the genealogy, when it's, there's the breakdown coming all the way to, to, to Adam. So there's got to be a reason the scripture now stops here to describe these people as the sons of God. They were not sons of Cain. They were fallen beings. And their, intent, their assignment was to pollute the earth race so that God could not find a clear, uh, a, a pure seed with which to fulfill the prophecy he gave in Genesis 3, that it would be the heel of the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. So Job chapter 2, and there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So these were definitely not the sons of Cain or any other explanation that was in that um, that tweet, it was a TikTok response. Okay, cool. Um, someone said, I disagree with the lady, but I follow her logic. She's smart. <laughs> okay, thank you. God bless you. Okay, here is the one that tickled me. And I was, I was determined not to respond to this one, at least not there, not how they wanted me to, because they wanted me to respond with a video. And I was like, I'm not going to. If I start here, I'm going to be doing 500 individual videos to different people. He says, okay, does this mean angels have penises? 
These fallen angels were created to be in heaven. There's no need for a penis in heaven. Balance me there, he says. Okay, so here's my... <laughs> ah, Father God. So let me just respond to that one. Um, if you think about the fact that uh, Satan came as a serpent, when we, when we have the description of how he was created in heaven, he was never made with scales. He was never made to crawl on his belly. He was not made as a serpent, but he assumed that body for what it is he wanted to accomplish. And so these fallen angels assumed a form for the assignment that they desired to accomplish. Guys, life is more spiritual than it is physical. I promise you, you're out there having conversations with people that you have no cooking clue. Uh, how many are actually people walking amongst us and how many are not. So uh, I'm hoping that that answered the question that no, the fallen angels received the form of men to be able to accomplish what it is they wanted to do in the earth realm. But thank you for, for that, for that uh, comment. You know what? Black people, when they think they know better, black people are colonized and brainwashed. Have you seen Jesus in your visions or your dreams, sister? So um, again, I am hearing the pain in this comment. Um, you know, there's, there's, whew, this is such a deep one. In terms of the psychological things going on with this person, I think that the, w when you can't address an issue and you have to belittle the person that you're referring to, it just shows how bereft your argument is of much logic. Uh, so apparently I am colonized and brainwashed, but I think I know better. The one thing that was really clear in my prayers when I went on that day was, Lord, help me to come across with humility. There are many things I've been praying for for myself. One is wisdom. I pray and I have prayed for the longest time for the wisdom of God. The other thing I pray for continuously is graciousness, grace, to be an embodiment of that grace to be able to tell you something and not have you feel beaten up, right? And the reason is that sometimes you, you grow up to find that the other person's opinion, either you, you begin, begin to agree with it or you begin to have the experiences they've had that help you understand why they think the way they do or you just have that empathy, you have that um, emotional intelligence by virtue of maturity. And so one thing we're not going to do is to, is to call names. Um, my faith and the faith of many of us who I think have asked for this kind of content is most definitely not based on colonization. Guys, if I begin to sit and tell you the encounters, the straight up hand holding, seeing the Lord in my circumstances, hearing his voice physically, feeling his touch physically, um, and the way he's come through for me, you would know that this, I keep harping on it. This is relationship. What I talk about and what I am so convicted uh, and convinced about was nothing anyone could read to me from a book. I mean, there were times when I would read the scripture or a pastor would share the scripture or my husband, who was much more advanced than I was spiritually, would say a scripture and I'll be like, nah, man, miss me with that. Because intellectually, I just could not. And he would look at me with that patience and just smile. And I wonder how he would go, you know, almost a decade just waiting for me to come to my own realization till the Lord will visit upon me the weight of that scripture. I shared with you during the podcast that the word of God has three forms. It is the logos, the rhema, and the epinesis. The logos being the word, the rhema being a personal revelation. You know, like when a you walk into a room, it's dark, but you put a light bulb on or a flashlight and you point it to a specific thing. So there's other things in the room, but at that point in time, the flashlight is focused on this thing and that thing becomes revealed to me. It's shape and it's form in many ways I had not seen previously. That's a revelation where I need a specific word for a situation that I'm going through. And the word then comes to me and tells me, listen, this word is for this situation, pray it this way. That's a revelation, that's a rhema. And that is why you would find it seems what I'm reading seems different from what you're reading, etc. cetera. Um, but the epinesis, uh, the epinesis is the pinnacle where the word becomes flesh literally, where I can tell you, listen, Genesis 5, 3, and I'm just throwing that out. So if you go look for what Genesis 5, 3 says, I don't know right now, but you, you, Genesis 5, 3 literally came alive for me. 
such and such a person walked into my life and it, it happened. It's not a fairy tale. Um, and so we can sit here and exchange words, but till you come into that kind of experience, and my responsibility is to pray you into that kind of experience. I cannot um, convince you otherwise. Okay. I just want to quickly talk about something that um, Saul asked during that uh, podcast. He says to me, why is it that the word um, seems to have just so many different interpretations? Why can't it just be clear? Why can't I just read it and it is what it says it is? And, and my response, which I just alluded to now, is depends on whether you're encountering the Logos, the Rhema, or the appendices of the word. But the one thing I just want to share that I didn't share during the podcast was the Lord says that it is the glory of the Lord to hide. He hides things in the scriptures for you to find. Because, um, okay, let me finish this train of thought. It says glory to hide. It is your honor as a king to search it out. And I really believe that if you are a kingdom, so if you're in a kingdom serving the king of kings, and who are the kings? That's us. That's you and I. We are royalty. And we need to search out the word uh, to show ourselves approved. So it is in that searching that you will find things. And, and the way you find this one verse today might appear different from how you find it tomorrow because your experiences, the word is living and it is active. That is why it can't just, I just read it and it just, you know, just what it says. It is living and active. When something is alive, I've got children. I look at, at my boy when he was three months old because he is living, looking at how he is at three years old, two it's the same person. It's the same essence, but he looks different. His personality comes out different to me because we're at a different stage. He's at a different age, etc. So I'm hoping that that makes sense. So um, what we need to be doing is coming to that place where we are doing the honorable thing as, as kings and searching out the word. And that which we find then is that which we have, help me to express this. What we find in the word is what we have the audacity to have faith for. You know, so you can tell me something in the scriptures if I haven't seen it. My faith is not an audacious faith. I'm kind of living off what you said. But the minute I see it, I experience it for myself. Ain't nobody can tell me nothing. Like, I, I, I own it, right? And um, so that might be one amongst the other explanations that I gave as to why uh, the word seems to constantly be shifting uh, shape and form, whereas it is the same word. It is a living, active, sharp weapon. Okay, then, uh, okay, here he says, but read scripture correctly, guys. He said the light, the door, the way. Never, this person says never, did he say the only way. Um, that word never is very strong. Had he or she, I don't see who it was, oh, she, if she had said in that scripture, he did not say the only way, then she would have been, I would have been fine with what she's saying. But she says, never did he say, which means that we need to look in other parts of scripture. And then that is contradicted because in other parts of scripture, we are told that there is no other name under the earth through which men can find salvation. So in John 14, uh, verse six, he says, Jesus says unto him, I am the way. And I like this. He didn't, he didn't say, it wasn't a past tense. He saith, so it's continuous tense. He's saying that to us even today. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I agree that the word only does not feature in this verse. However, there is no other way to interpret it when he says, no man can come to the Father but by me. A translation would say, only through me. So. Um, yeah, I would say that was that would not be the that that is the only way. Sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this one says so. Noah birthed kids of different races. What DNA and complexion? And uh, someone then responds to him, "The Bible is a myth, my friend." So you will find that there's been um, some African people who've been found with blonde hair and blue eyes, but there's no question that they are of the race of the African people. There isn't necessarily a trace at this point, and maybe I can be corrected, of um, white genealogy that has come through them. Um, when we do the research, we are told of their moving through, uh, moving geographically through time. So you've got these African people who are called Melanesian, 
They're found in the Solomon Islands. Their hair color is blonde. Their eyes are blue. And research tells us that it has not come. <clears throat> it's a gene mutation that has arisen from the Pacific but has not been brought in by fair-haired Europeans into marrying with the islanders. Instead, it, the, the characteristic arose independently in equatorial Oceania. Oceania. So, for example, you see um, certain breeds or species of animals who, having migrated from one place to another, have had to adapt different physiological um, mutations and, and characteristics to fit the environment where they are at. And this continues, that the adaptation even filters through their DNA, through their bloodline, so their children become the same even though those children, unlike them, never started in the places where they started off from. So yes, actually the DNA um, can adapt based on geography. So I think we should just read that up. But again, I appreciate your comment. Let's see. Um, okay, so I think that was, the, that was the tip of the comments that we got. Oh yes, there's this one. But Jesus Christ was seen consulting Moses and Elijah who were dead by his error. So will we, so we will never get it anyways. All right. Um, Jesus was not seen consulting Moses and Elijah. I was having a conversation with a man of God the other day and I found a really interesting angle that he brought this from that I hadn't thought about before. He, re he reminded me that Moses represents the law, Elijah represents the prophets, and Jesus represented the bringing of these things together where prophecy was fulfilled by his coming. And he says, I have not come that any of the law should be abolished, but that all of it should be fulfilled. And so what was happening there was a depiction for the benefit of us who read the Bible, and the disciples who were present at that time to see a coming together. So he, in essence, was saying, my coming is to bring these two together. Where we want to say, listen, we're doing away with the law, no more law. The law that has been done away with is the ceremonial law. There is no more need to kill and slaughter bulls and goats and sheep because Jesus Christ is the once and for all sacrifice. And none of that uh, is necessary anymore. But the other laws, such as, um, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, etc. And the other laws that pertain to how we relate to God and relate to each other, those still exist um, in addition to, to, to even like scientific laws of gravity, etc., etc., and the laws of creation when, that he set in the book of Genesis in the account of creation. So, um, yeah, let's just clarify that Jesus was not consulting ancestors. He was just, um, you know, having a, he was depicting something spiritual of the coming together of the law and the prophets. Okay. I think that was it that I had in terms of, of questions. Um, so we're going to be doing this. We're going to be doing this. We're going to have this quite regularly. Um, I think we will, as the Lord leads, invite uh, people who can help to break down some stuff further or um, who can just juxtapose, as I said before, show us um, what is out there so that we can make clear decisions. But I reiterate that the purpose of this platform is to awaken you to your innate God-given power and to see a bunch of human beings, whether you are African, American, European, whoever God knows he has sent me to. And if I'm not sent to you, it'll be obvious. But whoever he has packaged me for that is tired of a defeated life, that wants to work walk and work in purpose, in destiny, in power, in faith, in having the word come alive, in, in wielding that word as a sword against the wiles of the enemy, uh, to learn prophetic warfare, to learn how to do warfare prayers, to learn how to exercise your priesthood, how to raise altars, how to present at the gates of time, how to um, administer the earth realm for our Father and all aspects of creation, how to engage in prayer, whether as a uh, form of two-way conversation between you and God, or to go even deeper as a form of administration, eloquation, of articulation, of, 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 of judgment, of declarations, of stating and creating things the way they ought to be, the, the reality you want to see. If you want to learn all of those things, then I think that we are together on the right channel and we will take the steps as they come and glorify our Father. Again, 
Thank you so much for sticking with me. Remember to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share, let everyone know that the big haired lady that was on the Mac G podcast actually has her own YouTube channel and she's here to stay. I'll catch you again very soon. Shalom. God bless.